That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire, and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all. Because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hire a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team, and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can and often does develop the strategy for the company, but ultimately it's always the CEO who has the final go-no-go -no -go decision on strategy. Doctors know a lot about prescribing medications. Take two brisk walks and call me in the morning. But for many patients, a light get moving plan might be just what the doctor should have ordered. Many of us aren't exactly in peak physical condition. But a large number of people are actually deconditioned. So says the Mayo Clinic's Michael Joyner in an essay in the Journal of Physiology. After surgery, illness, pregnancy, or extended inactivity for any reason, People might feel faint or fatigued when they try even mild exercise. These signs, Joyner argues, should be recognized by doctors not as symptoms that should be treated with drugs, but rather as a medical state of deconditioning that might be better helped with a gentle, guided exercise program. Life in the UK 2012 provides a unique overview of well-being in the UK today. The report is the first snapshot of life in the UK to be delivered by the Measuring National Well-Being Program and will be updated and published annually. Well-being is discussed in terms of the economy, people, and the environment. Information such as the unemployment rate or number of crimes against the person are presented alongside data on people's thoughts and feelings, for example, satisfaction with our jobs or leisure time and fear of crime. Together, a richer picture on how society is doing is provided. You might picture Neanderthals as cavemen gnawing on bones around a campfire. Which wouldn't be inaccurate, but Neanderthals may have also dined on roasted vegetables and known a bit about medicinal plants too. So says a study in the journal Naturwissenschaften, The Science of Nature. Researchers analyzed hardened dental plaque from five Neanderthals found in El Cidron Cave, in northern Spain. Yes, 50,000-year-old dental plaque and they found a lot lurking between the teeth. Like evidence of nuts, grasses, and green veggies, chemical traces of wood smoke, and tiny, intact starch granules, proof Neanderthals ate their carbs. For four centuries, the Viking declined, the people of the Shetland Islands off the north coast of Scotland continued to sell their goods through the North European Hanseatic League. The Hanse's merchants bought shiploads of salted fish and in return the islanders got cash, grain, cloth, and other goods. This lasted until the Act of Union between Scotland and England in 1707. This act prohibited the Hanse merchants from sheltering with Scotland. Consequently, Shetland went into an economic depression. The independent farmers of Shetland had to sell their land and were then obligated to pay rent, eventually becoming serfs.
Perhaps you remember the dire predictions from the analysts. The fall-off in housing threatened to drag down the entire economy. High energy prices put the kibosh on consumer spending. Runaway inflation was poised to take off. David Weiss is an economist at Standard & Poor's. He says in the end, none of those things happened in the final three months of last year. One of the things that people have said about agriculture is that on the whole it's more labor-intensive than hunting and gathering, and that's one of the reasons why people have looked to explanations which, you might say, are kind of corrosive factors, that people have been forced into agriculture because they had no alternative. That is ultimately what may happen. But at the very beginning it could be that agriculture was developed because people wanted special status foods for feasting, that it was actually a social need. I mean, how much of what we do in our lives is generated by competition with others? And a lot of that is powered by desire for new things, new statuses, new whatever it might be. Respect, recognition also are important. And in small-scale societies a lot of those sorts of factors are generated by the ability to, for instance, throw feasts. One possibility is that some of these foods that were being grown were actually intended especially as feasting foods. Why do we need more entrepreneurs right now? The entrepreneurs who create and run our businesses, who play by the rules, are in fact critical to our success as a nation. We need them especially today. Business, not government, will end this recession. Government must help by creating fair rules, sound monetary policy, and by protecting our fellow citizens in periods when they are jobless. We have to make way for the new entrepreneurial firms that will push us to frontiers of innovation. It's not easy being yellow. Bananas now face two separate fungal epidemics, which threaten to pluck the fruit off of our tables. Fortunately, researchers have now sequenced banana DNA, producing the genome of a banana variety that may hold the secret to defeating the diseases. The report is in the journal Nature. Today, half of all bananas, including the ones you probably buy, belong to the Cavendish variety, whose popularity stems in part from having no seeds. But this trait also removes sexual reproduction from the equation. The bananas are thus all genetically identical and identically vulnerable to the two fungal epidemics, Panama disease and black leaf streak disease. Researchers sequenced the genome of a banana variety, called D.H. Pahang, whose genes contributed to the Cavendish. While the genome shows where this fruit fits in the history of plant evolution, it could also help researchers understand why D.H. Pahang, unlike its descendant is resistant to the funguses behind both Panama and black leaf streak disease. Knowing the genes responsible for this resistance could help breeders create stronger, more resistant bananas, which has a lot of appeal. Interesting sound. 
I would have guessed a Wild West performer was practicing with a bullwhip while also vacuuming. But no. That sound is apparently produced by the aurora borealis, the northern lights. Since 2000 researchers at Finland's Aalto University have been collecting audio, as part of what's called the Auroral Acoustics Project. Folk tales have long held that the lights also produce odd sounds, but the claims were hard to prove. And some researchers thought that any noise is produced by the energetic particles, that cause the light show would be far too high in the sky to be heard on the ground. But the latest results indicate that at least some sounds are produced very close to the ground. A setup of three ground-based microphones allowed researchers to estimate that the sounds occur perhaps just 70 meters up. The results were just presented at the International Congress on Sound and Vibration in Vilnius, Lithuania. More information about the sounds of the northern lights could lead to a more complete understanding of the phenomenon so if you see an aurora, keep your ears open. Just like corporations, stars, too, can engage in mergers and acquisitions, a new study has identified a pair of white dwarf stars heading toward a urger. White dwarfs are the hot, super-dense remnants of spent stars. In a binary system called J0651, two white dwarfs circle each other very rapidly. The binary pairing completes an orbit in less than 13 minutes. And that already rapid orbital dance is speeding up as the two white dwarfs spiral in on each other. Each year, their orbital period shrinks by 0.3 milliseconds. That's actually a pretty dramatic change on astronomical timescales in about a million years. The white dwarfs will get so close that the larger one will start to cannibalize its smaller companion before long. The two stars will likely become one. The study appears in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The tightly wound white dwarf binary should also be radiating gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space and time. But today's gravitational wave detectors are not sensitive enough to detect them. That's okay, astronomers have another million years, before things get really interesting, to build an instrument that's up to the task. Scientists are looking for Earth-like planets around other stars. But one way to limit the search can be to figure out where an Earth-like planet cannot exist and eliminate those types of systems. In a new study, astronomers turned their attention to so-called hot Jupiters. These are Jupiter-sized planets that have an orbit of only about three days. The scientists looked at 63 hot Jupiters to see if they could find evidence for any nearby Earth-like planets. They found none. But it could be that the companion planets are too small in size or mass or just aren't detectable with the current techniques. So the researchers then turned to hot Neptunes and Warm Jupiters, these are Jupiters with slightly longer orbits. They found only two potentials nearby planets among 222 hot Neptures. Tens of millions of sharks are killed for their fins each year. It's not just a tragic abuse of the animals. It's bad business. They're basically swimming dollar signs, whether you're trying to kill them for their meat or their fins or you're interested in looking at them for ecotourism. 
That's Austin Gallagher, a doctoral student at the University of Miami. I spoke with him on February 26. We did some calculations, and the results were remarkable. We determined that the average shark was worth about $200,000 over the course of its life. And when you compare it to finning that animal, a one-time extractive use, seeing it for diving is worth about 40% more. One day the banana is perfect. Bright yellow, firm, flavorful. But even within that same day brown spots appear on your perfectly ripe banana, its flesh turns mushy, and it's destined for the compost or at best, banana bread. But scientists are developing a way to extend the life of ripe bananas. It's a spray-on coating made from chitosan, a substance found in crab and shrimp shells. The new gel can be sprayed on bananas to slow the ripening process by up to 12 days. Like other fruits bananas remain alive after being picked and it actually continues to respire. This means that they take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. The more the banana breathes the faster it ripens and then rots. So in a very important tense, um, memory is the cognitive function that stores knowledge that we've acquired through learning and perception, but also memory is important because memory frees our behavior from being controlled by the present stimulus environment. If you didn't have memory, all you'd be able to do was react to whatever is currently in the environment now, whatever it is that you're experiencing. But memory allows us to respond to past events as well as events in the current stimulus environment. And memory also gives us the means to reflect on our experiences so that we plan for future encounters. My hero is Marie Curie. She was a Polish physicist and chemist working in France and she did conduct pioneering research on radioactivity. She was also the first woman who won a Nobel Prize. Marie Curie is my hero because she showed a lot of determination in following her career path and her passions. She also showed a lot of patience in working for years to receive results from her experiments. And Marie Curie, she designed and built the first mobile X-ray machines. She worked on the front lines of the First World War along with her daughter saving soldiers.